The search for a missing deep-sea submersible in the North Atlantic is now at a critical stage. There are fears that the oxygen on board is about to run out. The Titan vessel disappeared on Sunday off the Canadian coast while on a dive to the Titanic shipwreck site. There are five people on board, including the CEO of Ocean Gate, that's the company that designed and operates the sub. International search teams in a race against time. Hopes had been raised after underwater sounds were picked up on sonar equipment, but so far it's not been possible to pinpoint the vessel's location. What's more, the five crew on board left with only 96 hours worth of oxygen and by early Thursday it was expected to have run out. This is still a search and rescue operation. You know, the, the estimates of when the oxygen runs out and more importantly possibly that carbon dioxide takes over because if they've lost the power to the sub then carbon dioxide scrubbers are also failing. So there, there are a lot of things working against the people inside the um, submersible. But I think, you know, hope has to keep going. The area being searched is twice the size of the US state of Connecticut, in waters as deep as 4,000 meters. The equipment that's been mobilized for this is, um, is the finest in the world, uh, the most capable in the world. Uh, we have to hold out hope. But as time ticks by, that hope of finding the Titan soon is fast running out. It's a huge area uh, that they're having to search. If we had a few months to do this, the uh, outcome will be optimistic. We've only got a few hours, and this is the big problem. And we are now joined by Nikolai Rotterman. He's a deep sea ecologist and lecturer in marine biology at the University of Portsmouth in the UK. Nikolai, uh, first, the question that, of course, everyone is asking right now is there any hope people inside the sub uh, could still be alive? Um, it's entirely possible they could still be alive at this point, um, but the prognosis doesn't look good given uh, how much air is predicted to be left in the submersible and the complexities of first attempting to locate uh, the Titan and then potentially rescue them. Now, you have been on similar uh, submarines at very deep dives as well. Tell us, what does it feel like being down there? Well, it's, it's, um, you're very busy when you're doing a scientific dive, so uh, you don't have that much time to dwell on the experience. But something that always stuck with me was the fact that you're very conscious that you are in a, in a little metal ball, basically, a little bubble of air surrounded by an incredible pressure and weight of the deep ocean around you. And nature doesn't like a vacuum, so you're very much aware that that uh, nature wants to squish you. Now, if we assume that this submersible is somewhere on the bed of the ocean now, uh, talk to us about the environment there. How hostile is it, apart from the pressure that you've just described? Yeah, uh, at a depth of about 3,800 metres, um, the, the sea pressure is 380 times the pressure uh, on land. Um, it's incredibly dark. There's no uh, natural light, uh, no light from the sea surface penetrating. It's also very cold, probably somewhere between uh, around two degrees centigrade, somewhere between zero and four degrees centigrade. Um, and if they're in, in, in a submersible that has no longer any power, it's quite likely that they're very cold um, and in incredibly uncomfortable cramped conditions as well. Yeah, so aside from the, uh, the possible uh, uh, lack of oxygen and the ox oxygen running out, could the cold be uh, one of the big problems there as well? I mean, between zero and four degrees centigrade, um, how long can, can, can you survive in that condition? It uh, very much depends on what kind of clothing um, they took down with them. Um, typically, you should have contingency for being cold because it can get cold even after a standard eight-hour dive. Um, one of the factors that um, uh, sort of, uh, uh, one has to be cognizant of is that the colder you get, um, your uh, body starts to want to burn um, more uh, fuel to stay warm, and that requires oxygen. So your oxygen consumption will actually increase the colder you get. So that, that is um, 
an added factor in this. Nicolas Rotterman, there, deep sea ecologist and lecturer in marine biology at the University of Portsmouth. Thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us. Pleasure. And for more on the subject, we are now joined by DW's science reporter, Pippa Stevens. Um, Pippa, we talked about the oxygen supply. What exactly do we know about it and the whole design of this submersible? Yeah, so first of all, it's touched upon a little by your report, but that's the oxygen supply of four days is assuming the vessel still has power. If it does, some experts have said that it does depend on breathing rate, so it's not an absolute hard deadline of four days. There is a little hope it could extend a little longer. Um, so the vessel's made from carbon fibre. That's a light, very strong material. Um, it's cheaper than materials like titanium or steel. Um, OceanGate CEO himself said that it hadn't been used before uh, for a submersible vessel. Um, it's normally used in aircraft and yachts. Mm. Um, also, what's come to light has been that former crew members have talked about a waiver that they signed on the Titan. Um, and it was they were asked to understand that it was an experimental vehicle, not approved or certified by any regulatory body, that being on board could lead to injury, trauma or death. So I think what we really take away from this is it's an, an experimental vehicle. So did they take an unsafe vehicle to that kind of depth? Um, well, what I, what I can talk about is safety concerns that were mm -hmm. raised in 2018 about um, the submersible in development at the time. Now, that was by Ocean Gate's Director of Marine Operations. He said that the submersible needed more testing um, and that it could pose a danger to people going to extreme depths. He had concerns about the passenger sort of window at the front, that it hadn't been tested to deep enough depths. Um, he also felt like the warning, he also said the warning, um, he, sorry, he later said the warning system wasn't sufficient, that it could just go off, you know, milliseconds before an implosion. Um, there was a professional body in the same year in the US separately voicing concerns there wasn't third party oversight um, before launch. But it is worth saying that Ocean Gate has been running expeditions yearly to the Titanic since 2021 and Titan has made a successful voyage before. Mm. Now the rescue uh, mission of course is uh, up and running. Uh, what are the main problems that mis mission is currently facing? Well, it's unprecedented looking for something so small in such a massive area of, of water. Um, and your report also mentioned the sonar equipment. I think it's good to understand a bit of the nature of that technology. So sonar doesn't move in a straight line through water. So we had some sort of so far unverified, but reports of sounds yesterday from near the Titanic. Um, but trying to locate the vessel based off the back of the sounds because you don't have a, a straight line in, in water uh, makes it really very challenging. Um, I was at a briefing of scientists early this morning. There was a lot of discussion about this new underwater robotic vehicle that's been deployed overnight from France that can go down to depths of 6,000 metres. So there is some hope of the capabilities around that. Pippa Stevens, 30W Science. Thank you very much, Pippa. And let's get more now. We are joined by Simon Boxall, Senior Lecturer in Oceanography at the National Oceanography Centre, University of Southampton in the UK. Uh, Simon, I'd just like to begin by asking you, because it seems that it's just a matter of hours now until people on the submersible run out of oxygen. The rescuers say that they were still hopeful. Do you share this hope? I think one has to keep hope going. I think if we give up hope, then we give up the rescue. This is still a search and rescue operation. You know, the, the estimates of when the oxygen runs out, and more importantly, possibly, that carbon dioxide takes over, because if they've lost the power to the sub, then carbon dioxide scrubbers are also failing. So there, there are a lot of things working against the people inside the um, submersible. But I think, you know, hope has to keep going. Although the theory says that they ran out of oxygen sometime around about midday today in UK time, you know, they may well be able to survive longer. We don't know. It depends on the physiology of the people there, it depends on their condition. There are so many unknowns. So we have to keep this search going for the foreseeable future for the next day or two. And certainly the Coast Guard have indicated they intend to do that. At what They're stage does it go from being a... Sorry, yes. Sorry, Simon, um, I, I didn't want to interrupt you there, uh, but perhaps I can also just um, add a little food for thought. Why do you think that the search area has been so huge? I mean, one would expect that it, it should be more or less in the area of the Titanic wreckage. Well, you know, I think people assume that uh, they, they started putting the uh, submersible down uh, from the support ship over the top of the Titanic. 
they assume that it would just fall down straight down to the sea floor. Bearing in mind, it's falling two and a half miles. So as it's falling, it's gliding. You know, it's four kilometers. It's gliding as it falls. So you can imagine a glider up in the sky or a parachutist up in the sky falling down from that sort of height. They're going to drift sideways an awful lot. Add to that the complication that in this region, we have some very strong deep ocean currents. And those ocean currents can carry the vessel many miles as it falls towards the seabed. And then we're assuming they're on the seabed. We're assuming that they are on the seabed, which is the most likely scenario. Um, even then, they can be shifted uh, and begin to get buried a bit in some of the sediments. So there are so many complications in terms of how the thing drifts. And this is why, as time's gone on, they've enlarged the area. They know about, we know about the currents in that area. So they're allowing for the drift in those currents. Plus the hope that this noise and it is hope, we don't know for certain, might be coming from the submersible. They are trying to home in on that noise, which is away from the original search area. So it's not just a simple question of it drops like a stone to the sea floor. It could be, well, they're talking about size of Connecticut. It, it's a huge area uh, that they're having to search. If we had a few months to do this, the uh, outcome will be optimistic. We've only got a few hours, and this is the big problem. What's your opinion on submersibles like this? I would never go near one, personally, as an ocean oceanographer, and I've been doing this job for over 40 years. We don't need to use them for research. Um, there are, nowadays, on site at the moment, we've got the French um, uh, deep sea ROV, remotely operated vehicle. There's nothing we can do with a submersible that we can't do better with an ROV. And ROVs are safer. We don't put people's lives at risks. Um, ROVs can stay underwater for days at, at a time. They don't need oxygen, food, toilets and things. And so in research, we would use submersibles like the French one. We've got them in the UK, they've got them in Germany. You know, most of the big nations involved with ocean research have these deep sea ROVs. And they do a much better job than these submersibles. However, we have this sort of new range of, I suppose, extreme tourism, whether it's going up into space or going into inner space in the deep ocean. And I guess this is what's driving this sort of expedition. OK, well, we, we hope for a positive outcome in this case. Simon Boxall, Senior Lecturer in o Oceanography at the National Oceanography Centre, the University of Southampton. We appreciate your expertise.